I was just going to do a little intro and tell you guys a little bit about Youth Art Exchange and about the Youth Art Summit. Um, the Youth Art Summit is put on by Youth Art Exchange, um, and it's an annual gathering of young artists and educators. Um, it's the only event of its kind in the Bay Area. Um, it's a celebration of uh, youth and their contributions to the cultural fabric of the Bay Area. Um, this is the 10th year um, putting the event on, uh, the, first, the first year virtual. Um, and it's art is essential for connection and reflection and social change and building community, especially for youth here in San Francisco. Um, youth Art Exchange exists to make sure public high school students have the critical access to the arts. Um, and for, it's, it creates a link um, a shared practice between professional artists and public high school students. Um, and we it, we're excited uh, to have you here. Um, Trina is um, going to be um, hosting the panel. Um, she'll be our, our leader uh, this hour. Um, she is an artist, an educator, and a writer. Um, she works and in, with um, engaging participatory research strategies, generosity and cross-disciplinary platforms, learning pedagogies and social engagement. Um, Trina has focused on integrated learning practices and pedagogies and programs um, designed in leadership development in public and nonprofit education sectors. She is part of the integrated learning department at the Alameda C County Office of Education and she's been exploring the role of collecting thinking and action, actions in various contexts with others, forming communities of mutual practice and dialogue to engage in important issues of our time. Um, and Trina is also the co-chair of Youth Art Exchange's advisory board, and I'm proud to serve with her. So here you go, Trina. It's all yours. Yes, thank you, Beth, so much for that intro. Uh, my name is Trina, as Beth said, and I'm the co-chair of the board here at Youth Art Exchange. And today we're launching our 10th annual Art Youth Art Summit with a panel of amazing faculty from Youth Art Exchange who are going to talk about how they're engaging students in studio practice in this time of social distancing and online learning. Uh, but first, we want to kick off this week of learning and celebrating youth voices through acknowledging our local land, the places we live, work, and play. Coming off the heels of Thanksgiving holiday, a holiday that holds a lot of complicated histories for many of the people in our community and in our nation, we are thankful to live and work on the land called Yelamu, known as San Francisco, an ancestral territory of Ramatush Ohlone people who have continuously lived upon and cared for this land since time immemorial. Youth Art Exchange honors the indigenous people's past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders during the, including those of the lands from which you might be joining us virtually today. Today, I come to you from Chichenyo Ohlone land, known as the city of Richmond and the east of, eastern shores of the San Francisco Bay. And um, I'd like to just do a quick round of introductions of our faculty. They'll just wave so you can see who they are. So who will be presenting to you today. So we have Alyssa Aviz, uh, Matthew Brown, Francisco Mateo, Francisca Mateo, Francesca Mateo. Francesca Mateo, thank you. Chris Wood, Trish Callo, Alfie Macias, and Logan Kelly. So each of our faculty are gonna make a short presentation about um, how they're teaching this time of social distancing and online learning. And after their presentation, we'll have a Q&A discussion with them. So during their presentations, we're gonna ask that you hold off on asking questions or comments, and ple but please feel free to put them in the chat and then we will attend to them when we get to our Q&A session. So without further ado, I'm gonna kick it off over to Alyssa, who is our 2D discipline um, artist and faculty member, and she's gonna be talking about incorporating social justice into the curriculum. Hi there. Um, thank you so much, uh, Trina, for that introduction. So I'm going to share my screen with you and make my presentation. So um, again, my name is Alyssa Aviles, and I am a faculty at Youth Art Exchange. I uh, currently teach the printmaking program, and this is my almost my third year doing so. Um, 
So I'm gonna talk to you today about how I incorporate social justice into my curriculum. And um, just a little bit about my background. I am a printmaker, that is my main art practice. And um, something I've always really loved about printmaking is its sort of inherent quality in creating social justice work. Um, despite not necessarily being conceived in that way, something I do both in my practice as an artist and as an educator is um, really push the limits of the art form and um, really explore how we can create community through printmaking um, and how we can mobilize our youth and our communities to be involved um, politically and just you know be more socially aware. Um, yeah, so that is a little bit about my background. I am from San Francisco. I'm born and raised here. And so that influences a lot of my work and a lot of the communities that I work with as well. Um, and then just a little bit about my practice as an educator. Um, my teaching uh, pedagogy really stems from my experiences as a young artist. Um, the way that I was taught artwork was very rigid. Uh, very linear, kind of um, really very Eurocentric in um, just, you know, the histories that I was learning about, the artists, and um, also the path to success uh, as an artist was very narrow. And so um, that really stifled my creativity. And, um, you know, it's something that I'm still working around even now as an adult. And so um, this has really influenced my practice as an educator. Um, and it's really important for me to encourage my students uh, to explore uh, all the different possibilities and avenues that they have as artists. Um, and to know that there are many different forms of success as a creative person. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that the arts are a monolithic entity, and I believe that um, there's definitely other ways to achieve success as an artist uh, other than gaining recognition or acknowledgement from higher institutions uh, or you know, high profile galleries and whatnot. And um, there's often this separation between that kind of artistry and uh, social justice work. And I really, really want to emphasize that um, they're just all in one, that there's really uh, no separation, there's no highbrow or lowbrow type of work. And so um, this is something that I try to incorporate in my curriculum. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how I do that and the strategies that I implement in my classroom. Um, so the different, well, one thing I really want to emphasize is that uh, the way that I incorporate social justice into my classroom is not so much as a subject matter, but as an environment. And um, I do that by really encouraging my students to be uh, self-expressive, vulnerable, um, and just comfortable in this space to be able to create whatever they would like to create. Um, I believe that, you know, social justice seems like a really heavy word. And when we think about that word, we think about, um, you know, all of the different current events and uh, showing up in a radical way. But I think that really what's at the root of social justice is compassion and empathy and, um, really just being being seen and visibility. So in my classroom, I make that the framework and encourage students to view politics and view expressing themselves politically as sort of an extension of yourself and what you believe in. And so in that way, it doesn't seem like this kind of uh, adult topic that uh, is sort of unattainable to youth. And um, I also really, really strive to uh, teach students about artists who are currently living, working, women artists, uh, women of color, artists of color, artists who have really pushed boundaries and borders to achieve uh, what they have, and artists that are also working within the same themes that we are. Um, so 
those are just you know a few things that I like to do in my classroom. And also, by the way, the work that I'm showing in uh, these slides are mostly student work. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, and I think that as this year has unfolded, um, these topics have become much more relevant. We're very isolated. We are um, really just seeing everything happen in the world in a really magnified way. And so it's important to me that these topics are not contrived in our classroom. And so the way that I've been sort of implementing this curriculum with my students has been uh, really just kind of observing this, observing art as a type of transformation, a method of healing, um, and, you know, I, I think that we all have a lot of um, you know, anxiety, there's a lot of fatigue going on. And so I really just try to encourage my students to reflect on what is happening around them and express whatever they feel that they need to express, whether it's very radical, um, whether it's, you know, extremely political or whether it's just like an expression of how they're feeling. Um, or, you know, something that they would like to uh, say to their audience, because I think that everything that we do is political. And so, um, you know, there's really no right or, or wrong way to um, address something like this, especially as a youth. Um, and so really just normalizing politics, normalizing these expressions, um, you know, also avoiding, avoiding tokenizing, um, different like holidays or uh, heritage months and just encouraging my students to always acknowledge these groups of people and always acknowledge um, these different movements that are going on. Um, having frequent reflections, discussions, um, and really just again emphasizing transforming tragedy or hardship into healing through artwork. Um, About 30 seconds left. Okay. And um, yeah, I, you know, we mostly do printmaking. So we have just kind of been adapting to being at home and um, just really focusing on uh, sustainable materials and better practices that are more accessible. Yeah, that's just a snapshot into my classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was amazing. The work is just stunning that the students are making. Um, we are next going to hear from Alfie Macias, who is our music uh, faculty, and he's going to talk about adopting to ongoing challenges of distance learning. And I just want to note that our faculty are extremely accomplished uh, artists in the Bay Area and beyond in the, in the nationally and internationally. And um, Chantel is going to put a link to their, uh, to our website where you can see their bios um, after this, this um, session if you're interested to learn more about them. Okay, Alfie. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, first of all, thank you um, for uh, including me in the panel. Um, I feel privileged to be with my peers and also to be uh, expanding out and connecting. And um, I'm always just a fan of anything Trina does. So thank you for hosting um, this uh, event. Um, Trina's been a great mentor to me as an artist and teacher and faculty member and um, just uh, been there and here again. So thank you for having me. Um, okay, I wanted to just uh, talk as far as my presentation goes, um, because I'm really speaking about um, having to adapt to the change of distance learning and um, the whole impact that it's had uh, on the students. Um, and really uh, on my program, which is a very in-person um, technical sound program. Uh, so here we go. Um, so um, I'll give you a little bit of backstory about uh, the program that I'm running at uh, Youth Art Exchange. Um, I've done a combination of traditional uh, percussion preservation programs. Um, that have been in collaboration with uh, schools um, 
and as well as uh, SF Jazz. But currently I'm working in audio production and we've uh, converted a uh, butcher uh, shop, an old butcher shop that was closed for almost a de decade into an art hub. And the meat locker uh, has been converted into a surround sound studio. So um, before everything changed, we were finally in a place where uh, we were dealing with like five point sound and um, in a place where we could do proper recording. Uh, we had artists that were, uh, youth artists that were getting ready to release uh, LEPs, um, short four song releases. Um, and then everything shut down and we had to go into distance learning. And um, that took us uh, head on into the point that's really been the impact zone for us which is affecting everybody which is the digital divide um and it's really um uh a struggle for teachers that are working in certain levels of technology um the chromebook that's being given out just doesn't cut it it's kind of a of a pad setup or an iso setup so it just can't really handle um proper software and anything that's moving a lot of CPU usage. So um, we end up in a place where um, many students, uh, because of um, uh, their economic situation, did not have um, spaces, um, did not have equipment, did not have um, even um, the luxury of uh, desks or um, places where they could properly um, connect and try to continue their education. So as far as our program goes, it was really about shifting from, from um, being in a space that was catered to high definition sound and audio production and switching to um, laptop speakers, headphones, and then um, the issue of Zoom being kind of substandard as far as its um, audio capability. I know I'm just at, are we at four minutes, right? Because my that was my four minute time. One minute, okay, cool. So I'll try to speed it up. Um, <clears throat> so we quickly had to kind of uh, maintain what's important as far as the educational goals and understanding, um, but kind of lower the bar at the same time. And uh, my focus was really to kind of try to create an art oasis and not to um, push high production value. Uh, and uh, then we had to enter this whole software juggle of trying to get equipment or free programs or something that worked on a phone, something that worked on a PC, um, mini programs I'd never even seen before. but could use the same principles of audio production to kind of get them to work for the youth. Um, and uh, then we just uh, approached it in what they ha what do they have and how do we get it to function for them? Um, what I quickly noticed though, is that we had to kind of pause all that because there was so many different levels of um, home situations emotional situations, comfortability with interacting with the technology, um, distance learning technology, um, interacting in that environment in a classroom with other students. And so uh, what we really had to do was go heavy into the breakout rooms and go one-on-one, -on -one, which slowed everything down, but was able to really um, bring back the classroom communication, bring back the student um, teacher connection um, and really build those uh, relationships with the students individually. Um, so that's um, really what we've had to adapt to, to kind of coming away from where we thought we were going to be and, and develop this whole new system of working with the student and making sure that they're um, able to get what they need out of the equipment that they have in the time that we have together while also maintaining a really core center of 
providing a safe space and um, uh, a pathway to kind of see a way out of this. Um, and that's where I'll pause it because I think I'm at my time. Yeah. Thanks so much for your uh, sharing your what's happening with your students in your classroom. Next, we have Chris Wood, and he is um, he's teaching at John O'Connell High School in our, our uh, in-school program, and he teaches construction. He's going to be talking about staying engaged and invested as an educator in this time. So, Chris. Uh, thank you, Trina. Um, and thanks for uh, inviting me on this. I feel actually kind of a little bit of an odd man out here where I'm surrounded by artists and I'm actually kind of a builder type, really. So uh, staying engaged for me has been kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting challenge. I mean, my, my whole raison d'etre, you know, as an educator in San Francisco Unified, I teach at, a, at John O'Connell High School as well, is to provide hands-on learning, which we don't have any hands-on learning. And I, we don't really have a, or I haven't developed a way to, uh, to really do hands-on uh, remotely, right? I, 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 I can't afford, and, and, and they won't allow us to give them, to give out toolkits um and uh you know material distribution is just the scale that's kind of difficult so um so it has been kind of interesting to stay engaged especially if you're kind of a homebody like i am i'm perfectly comfortable sitting at home all the time but i have uh you know i still have responsibilities teaching um with the yaks programs uh i co-teach uh, i'm co-teaching id with um with trish and um you know, so so that's kind of a, a thing that we, we we do together, and that's impossible to not be engaged because uh, you know there's somebody else that's leading the charge there. Um, but to to for me to stay engaged, you know, it it, it would be easy for me to just kind of um, you know say, well, can't do hands on what to do now. But what I have found is is a, a few things that that can happen. Um, with distance learning, um, I think the top epiphanal moment, you know, was when I realized that one of the biggest problems at our school site um, was absenteeism, you know, students just not showing up. Um, on a regular basis, I think we have, I mean, crazy numbers, 25 to 30% every day don't show up to school. And previously that, you know, in a hands-on situation, that's, you know, if you're not there, you're not doing it. And, um, <clears throat> but what I've found is that this is, you know, the online, the online plot, you know, the online format is forcing us to, to make curriculum in a discipline that otherwise we hadn't. So, you know, if there's a silver lining, I've got all kinds of recordings and all of the virtual ways that I do things that we used to do together. For instance, site tours. I'll put a GoPro on my helmet and go out to a site, take a tour because they'll let me tour, but I can't take students. And so I take students on virtual tours. And the upside is my questions are typically, um, you know, what I want them to get out of the out of the process. So when I ask a question of the guy giving me the tour, that's what the guy is talking about, you know, the lead, the it's typically a project engineer or something like that. So so I've stayed engaged by developing uh, curriculum that I otherwise wouldn't have and that is can be evergreen because I can use it with students uh, on an ongoing basis. And that way when they do come to class, I don't have to do that stuff. That stuff can all be stuff that's done at home and done remotely. Um, and it's already prepared to be done that way. So it's really kind of helped me in my, my pedagogy there. I don't know how I'm doing on time. What are the other, uh, let's see. Uh, and one of the other things that I've done, I teach a workshop class as well. And, uh, and how much? You have 30 seconds left. 30 seconds, yeah. And uh, you can focus on uh, critique and curating very well in distance which is um, something that, um, that I do for my woodshop class because I, that's the, even the most uh, you know, poorly adapted to a distance learning uh, uh, thing. So 
so really just, you know, in short, that's how I'm staying engaged is developing. It's, it's what every teacher asks for is more time to plan. And, uh, and we have a lot more time to plan. Three hours of commute and three hours a day online doesn't add up to eight. So you have more time to do it. So that's been kind of staying invested is kind of planning for the future and making new connections with industry and furthering those. Thanks. I love the idea of these virtual tours with students. And um, so next we have Trish Callow, who is our industrial design teacher. And she's going to talk about, and Chris referenced her, they have a collaborative teaching practice at Youth Art Exchange. And so she's going to be talking about keeping students engaged and emotionally invested. So Trish. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Trina. Um, so I think really what I've tried to offer to students uh, uh, what I've actually tried to offer to students really starting back in March is this is a design studio. Um, and first and foremost, architects and designers are problem solvers to real life. It, it is who we are at the most essential. So there were sort of two things that we did very quickly and we've continued doing it in studio. One is we as designers had to figure out how we were going to have studio together. Uh, it's kind of a vital life force of um, designers to be in studio together. So I really brought students in and said, you are designers in here. We are all colleagues in here. Let's come up with different ways to do this um, and really exploit the technology that we could. So we used a lot of different platforms, um, not just a single place, not just Zoom. We actually had Zoom. We used a collaborative pinup board. We used Classroom. We sort of went at it in every different way and then could all decide as fellow designers in the studio what was working and what was, you know, what we could drop away. So really sort of engaging students to say, you are designers, there's very few things in life that are more real life than a pandemic. How do we respond to that to continue working together? Uh, the other part of it too was we shifted very quickly to having the design projects in studio respond to what was really happening. Um, so projects that students may have been working on, we really pivoted. And right now um, we're actually working on a project in this fall semester, which is how do we create architecture and uh, PPE to allow us to come back together in a community setting? Um, that's where we're at. And so I have really tried to foster students to be invested in this because their ideas are powerful. And they are problem solving. And I have to say, um, one of the most kind of amazing things that I have seen is they really are designers and they are coming up with some pretty amazing, very fan really kind of fantastic solutions for how do we come back together in a community space, whether it's going to the theater, being in a restaurant, being in the park. Um, and I think using design tools like rapid prototyping so that we're not getting too fussy about finished models, that's really liberated the students. So they're generating a lot of ideas, a lot of work that they can then share. And I think the one thing that I will show before I hand off, I'm gonna share my screen. And this is actually the Miro board that we've used over the course of several studios. And as you can see, this really becomes a place for students, just as if we're standing in studio together. We have a place to pin up work. We have a place to post our ideas. I post drawing assignments that we're doing in studio together, but we can go back to it. Um, the post-its over here, this was a work session that the students had in terms of putting together the exhibition presentation for the end of this week. So really, they're operating the way professional designers operate. And I've reminded them that, in fact, we often work on projects that cross, um, you know, county lines and country lines and state lines. So this is actually a way that more and more designers are working. And I think, again, elevating them from students and saying, you are designers, you are colleagues in the studio space. This really is how you work. It's really kept them deeply invested in it because they can actually share ideas sort of in the Zoomlandia world that we're all living in. So. Trish, you have about 30 seconds left. Okay, so I would actually say exploiting all and every potential 
technology and a lot of it is free. It's free that we're at right now. And then also putting it in the realm of real life, designers solving problems in real life. Right now that real life is a pandemic. Next we have Francesca Matteo. She's a fashion faculty at Youth Art Exchange and she's gonna be talking about teaching techno technical artistic skills through the use of the computer. Hi everyone. Uh, I am not muted. Okay, perfect. My students always call me out on being muted when I start talking. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I am the fashion instructor. I've been involved with the act since 2018, so a couple years now. And you know, with fashion design, it's a very tangible art form. You know, we, we want to feel things, feel the texture, see stitches. Um, and that's very, very difficult through the computer screen. Um, like, especially some of my students don't have working cameras or um, sometimes like the internet's a little wonky. So to even see some of the details, it, it's definitely more difficult in person. Um, but some advantages that I've relied on, at least with virtual learning, is that now I'm able to have kind of like a home base for um, different samples and um, in multiple formats. So I'm going to share my screen to show you what that means. Um, so this is kind of an example of how I start off my classes. Like, you know, we have our community agreements, check-in question, and what we'll be working on. But you'll see um, I'll have a simple slideshow like this. And I will go over um, the instructions myself and then show a video so that they will get kind of instructions two times, but with different visuals. And then at least on my end, I can slow down and answer any questions. Um, oh, I totally didn't introduce myself. <laughs> this was my introductory slide. So this is me with my students from the past two summits. So this one is 2018, 2019. They just finished their fashion show of their final projects. Um, so I'll get back to this later. Um, other examples, so like for instance, for Summit, we're putting together a lookbook video um, in terms of like trying to really get those technical skills out. It's really about showing all these different examples. So for this one, um, we're talking about different ways to photograph and create portfolios of your fashion projects. So um, you'll see like we are making masks. We're also transforming tops. And they're also making their own bags. So we'll, we uh, spend time discussing things that they notice about these photos, what they like, how they think that they can utilize it for their own work. Um, and then even for, I'll show them a lot of examples from my former students. So this is, I think, fall 2018. But what I really want to show you all and how to break down the technical things. So what I love to do is show work from my former students and do a breakdown of what they did so that um, my current students know that these dope projects are also possible for them with the tools and the skills that we're giving them. Right. So you'll see I kind of have like these simple bullet points at the end of each project. Another one here. Um, mind you, this project, they all just started off with a white tee. So anything that you see, they dyed, bleached, cut, sewed all themselves. Um, so another example. Yeah, so I'm very, very reliant on these visuals. But um, another thing that's helpful with going all digital is that the students have access to all of these slides so that, for example, um, if they want to remember tips for fabric painting, they can go ahead and play this video. If I'm not available, um, like if it's after class hours, another really hefty example, if you want to see some like real, real technical skills, um, we have another slide just to see how they can create a pattern for a tote bag. 
So again, we're not just throwing all of these information with the students, um, me and then I have two other co-teachers in fashion design. Um, we really break down and show how to create something such as a tote bag. We go by the steps one by one. Um, but all of this information is available for the students for future reference um, so that they can always come back to it. Francesca, so the, about 30 yeah. seconds left. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then you'll see we have the mask here with a video and then this mask has a PDF. Okay. So all in all, um, as much as I miss being able to like feel the fabric and see how things fit with my students, like their brand new projects, um, I'm very happy that like, at least in terms of teaching technical skills, it's kind of pushing me to show them more examples and um, kind of like more possibilities. It's forcing me to be creative too in how to teach them. Thank you. Um, thank you, Francesca, that was great. Um, so Matthew Brown is up next and he's our photo film faculty. He's gonna talk about his process for community building. Hi, um, my name is Matthew Brown. I'm the photo and film instructor here at Youth Art Exchange. Um, I've been teaching for about four years and um, you know, the, the transition between um, in class, in person to fully online was, well, A, we did it really fast, which I think was a big plus for Youth Art Exchange that we kind of kept this consistency that, you know, we're still gonna have class. It's gonna be online, but we're here. And I know now the whole world is upside down, but we're gonna still be here in this time together. And I think that was important. Um, for our students to kind of keep that consistency. So um, let me share my screen. I just wanted to give you guys some ideas on how I create community within my class. Um, and, you know, just thoughts going forward. If you are creating an online class, working with high school students, um, what works, what doesn't. Um, so one thing is, is to build a container. Um, I think it's important to build a strong framework within your class so students know what to expect and how to interact while in the class. Um, I think this is something you build with each group of students that you teach. So I like to begin my se semester with writing um, a list of expectations with my class. So my students interact, they think about um, what is important for them to create a, a safe place to learn and connect. Um, by having them take part in setting the expectations, everyone becomes more accountable. Um, I think it's, it's so important to start strong and start by saying, you know what, this is how the class is going to work. Um, and I think students really respond to that. They respond to a structure and you know, you can play within that structure, but if they rely on this kind of con consistency, they know, um, where these pockets of interaction can, can occur. Um, so create constants. Um, if, you're, if you create a familiar structure for your class, your students will feel more comfortable because they know what is expected of them. Uh, this can create more harmony and interaction when students know when it's time to interact and when it's time to focus. So my um, online class structure looks like this. I start always start with a check-in prompt or an icebreaker. Um, so at the beginning of class, um, I usually pose a question that students, as they come in, can answer on the chat. Students love the chat and kind of inner, making sure that they are getting really comfortable with the chat and then also sharing later, I think is a good way to kind of get the class really moving. Um, so they answer um, in written form. And then after a couple minutes, we kind of go down the list and and just spend some time sharing our answers and it could be as simple as you know just reading what you've uh you wrote in the in the text in the chat or you know you expand on it and their dialogue starts happening um also by keeping this consistent students expect it and enjoyed beginning the class this way um i i had this this idea early on in my teaching too that icebreakers are cheesy um, and they can be at times, but I think almost that 
allows for humor to come out. And, you know, then there's also icebreakers that are a little more um, challenging, um, even simple ones like um, describe how you're feeling right now in using only seven words. Um, and, you know, you can get these really interesting responses. So I really like um, mixing up my icebreakers and check-in prompts, but I always try to keep that consistent. Then I go into my main lesson. This is where um, I try to keep it to around 20 minutes. You don't want to go too long. Uh, most of your prep work will go into creating a compelling lesson that is uh, clear and focused and engaging. Um, but also try to make it a little interactive. Um, posing a question with a slide and asking them, um, getting their responses and then revealing the answer and the next slide can be plenty. Um, it's like Jeopardy, you know, they like a little bit of interaction. And, you know, I think the main thing is keep things moving, uh, keep it focused and get to a point where we can, again, experience like a pocket of interaction. Um, after the main lesson, I try to get them moving. And I think this is really important. Um, they're on Zoom sometimes um, four to six hours a day, sometimes longer. Um, so I really like to try to break up the screen time. So after the lesson, I try to get them away from their screens. Usually I give them an in-class assignment where they have to go take a photograph with the technique I just taught them. Um, maybe we're um, learning about color theory and different color uh, schemes. Um, I'm like, all right, everyone get up, go search for a photo and, um, you know, focus on the three different color schemes that we just talked about and see which one um, you can find within um, your house or your neighborhood. Um, I think it's just important to get them moving um, and create a sense of like, we're not just going to be here for two hours looking at the screen. We need to get up, we need to stretch and we need to keep um, moving. And it's also just a time to see what they're, if they're um, grasping what you're teaching them. Matthew, you have oh. about 30 seconds left. Okay. All right. So then um, sharing session. Um, and this is where I, I think I see them grow the most um, and that they the community grows is where we just look at each other's work. Um, we look at photographs. Uh, we share each other's work and we say, hey, what's, what do you like about this photograph? What stands out? Where does your eye go when you look at this photograph? And this is where I will take into when I go back to in class, because we would do that, but it would be scattered. But having it more focused and more part of the structure of the class really allows for the class to grow and interact with each other. Um, so I think that's really important um, is just taking a look at everyone's work, seeing where they're at, and you know it's really rewarding i've seen shy kids really blossom um when you know someone says you know i really like your work i really like how you took a photograph in this certain light in this way it can really boost someone's um confidence and then people start sharing a lot more and more and it grows um i have there's so many things to talk about i'll wrap up with also, it's just important to have, you know, individual check-ins. So twice a week, I make a time on Wednesdays where I check in individually with kids. Maybe it's just a couple minutes, but I'm just seeing, hey, how you doing? Um, what, what, what's your individual project looking like? Are you feeling like you're on track? Is there anything I can do to help you? And just having that, creating that constant space to, to check in. Um, so. Yeah, that's just a couple quick um, thoughts on community building that I found effective um, in the online learning. Thank you so much. It was great. Um, so our last faculty to present is Logan Kelly. He's our architecture faculty, and he's gonna talk about hybrid programs. So Logan. Thanks so much, Trina. It's really interesting to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Um, I am the faculty architect for Youth Art Exchange. So, uh, to wrap up all the talks, I'll be talking about transitioning from in-person to virtual and then back again. So the architecture class has been meeting in person, uh, which is very interesting. So the architecture firm is typically a year-long design build class. The pandemic has made it two years, and this length of time in and of itself is very difficult for the students. Projects take a long time. 
architecture takes a long time. And this project, because of the pandemic, is taking a long time. These are some screenshots from what happened before we went on the pandemic. Lots of hand model making, lots of full scale, uh, lots of full scale mock-ups of their design. And the project is a street furniture piece in Excelsior. I won't get too much into the project, more of just the methodology here. Um, so we've partnered with the planning department of Office of Economic and Workforce Development to construct street furniture for the Excelsior neighborhood. When the pandemic hit, uh, it, was, it was a flurry and we transitioned into online learning. The first uh, step of that was introducing the students to a steep learning curve with the variety of web-based programs that are free that they can use to create the art. And I, uh, I'm a big proponent of getting the students to understand free programs out there and use them to create art. So we had a number of tutorials that was open to all students. And they're up on YouTube now, so you can check them out yourself. Um, and then we, we transitioned to online learning. We had a small project of creating uh, homes for homeless people in unique ways that were displaced because of the pandemic. Each, uh, the students worked mostly individually and kind of as a group critiquing each other's work. We also used the Miro kind of pinup board that Trish was talking about, and we uh, collaborated with Trish's class a lot. And these are some images that they came up with of uh, interesting housing ideas to house those displaced by the pandemic. When fall came, we went back to our original project and it had been a while and it had been the length of the summer and it had been the length of the second half of the spring semester. So uh, it, it took a while for us to kind of get back into gear and start actually project building. Um, the Boys and Girls Club, which is where the one of the Yak Studios is located was nice enough to let us use their back lot which is what you're seeing here where the students are beginning to construct this real life project that will be out in the public in the weather in real life um so i i think just the length of time and the slowness of it all is difficult for the students to uh to cope with and you know being outside we had to pack everything up at the end of the day and we had to take it all out in the beginning of the day and you know this this has a mental toll on the students they're all masked uh, you have to be super organized as opposed to having a messy studio which is a great thing about learning architecture is having a messy studio we couldn't do that we had to clean up after ourselves um, but you could tell that they were very happy to just be together and be doing something uh, with their hands. Um, there was a lot of protocols, you know, have to wear masks and have to sanitize at all the time, at all times. Um, but uh, in the end, uh, you can tell that they're excited to be back um, in person. Uh, like I said, I think I, I think the length of time compiled with the um, the length of time of this project compiled with the facts that they are mostly on the computer every day and don't usually work in teams anymore or don't work in teams is the same way that they, ha that they have worked in the past. Um, it's, it, it is difficult for them to work together and I do see, you know, in the near future uh, trying to like cross the river back into team-based project learning, which may be hard in the future and um, and I think is why something like art and project-based learning through construction is so important, is to kind of reignite that fire that uh, you know, students work together. So these are just some videos that I took with my iPhone. And, and also presenting a project back to the public has proved really interesting. We usually go out to Sunday streets and present to the community and ask the community questions for feedback. Obviously we can't do this, so we're uh, finding new ways to share the work and and for the youth art summit uh, the students have been um, the students have been doing these little interviews of explaining the project one by one um, and so uh, the youth the youth art summit final project will just be a series of explanatory videos uh, which is another great way for the students to engage with the public in a different way uh, but still in a real way so thanks so much Great. Um, really looking forward to seeing uh, students' presentations on Friday. We have just a few minutes left, and we thought we'd open it up to the audience for any uh, questions you might have, Q&A. 
Um, so are folks able to, are there questions out there that folks have that they want to pose? So um, I have a question. Sure. Hi, thanks. Um, this is great. I'm really enjoying this. I live in a really rural area in the Eastern Sierra of California. So we have had the hardest time getting any kind of virtual programming going outside of, so I guess I had a couple questions. One is like, how did you attract these groups of kids and, and keep them in the first place? Like, are they getting credit from the high schools? So they're just like motivated because we're just, we had one kid for one of our virtual storytelling art projects and I just don't know how to go forward. Um, definitely credit is awesome um, so that um, kids are, right? School is K through 12 is transactional. If you do this, you get that. Um, so I think there's a real plus to that. But I think also um, one of the common threads through all of our studios is that even in a virtual space, um, students are actually making work. Um, and yes, it's a little bit different because they're sitting at home doing it versus being in studio. But I think all of us really got on board very quickly with figuring out how to put home kits together for the studio and they're making things and building things. And I think at the end of the day, making the work and making the art is one of the biggest reasons why um, students continue to show up. And I think we've had huge attendance rate this fall semester, which you would say is the opposite of what we expected. But I think all the studios, I know in our studio, attendance has been great. And I think doing stuff, having them do in-studio drawing, having them make things, I think that's a big way to sort of incentivize them. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat that says, what are the most successful icebreakers, starter activities that you've had in your classes? Does anybody want to share some of their favorite icebreakers or openings for their class? Yeah, I can share um, how I started off my entire class session was I created a slideshow and every single page of the slideshow, the students made a mood board that was an introduction to themselves. So I had four prompts, I think, for it. So it's like their name, pronouns, and school. Um, what about fashion is essential to you? And I can't remember the other ones, but at the end of creating the mood boards everyone shared so that was like a great introduction to each other as well as an introduction to getting their minds thinking about fashion and how that's a link to expressing themselves great anybody else want to share any other faculty want to share their opening favorite opening icebreakers yes alfie uh yeah there's um i mean we're in music so uh i've tried to bring my students back into um, listening to music together as an experience and um, kind of asking them all to bring uh, something, a song forward that they like, regardless of what they thought their peers, how they might receive it. Um, something that was like genuinely um, coming from them or they had a deep connection to, and then starting, uh, a talking circle uh, on that and kind of expanding that and letting that take up like the whole class sometimes uh, just allowing um, you know my students can be like around eight to ten so um, allowing them to play the song speak on why they do it you know basically bring something to the table to share that um, gives some backstory and perspective on them and then having everyone do that creates a really unique um, connection. And then one of my simple ones is I just use the chat like in a really silly way. Like, you know, if you were an ice cream or an oat cream uh, Sunday, what would you be? And I just let them do it silently. And then we kind of giggle on that. And, um, you know, I just use the technology to kind of uh, to get in there. Um, but the music sharing has been really um, beneficial. And I think you could do it in any class, right? Because um, 
these students like kind of live on music. So you could do it in architecture, you could do it in other classes, you could um, develop things that are inspired by listening to somebody else's favorite song. Um, and I'll close it there. Yeah, we have one last question, just maybe a quick response from a couple of our faculty. Does anyone have any advice for someone pursuing a career in art education in regards to this new online frontier? Um, advice in general, how can I best serve the fu my future students? Anybody have a, a closing thought on that you could add, faculty? I'm going to offer my own personal opinion because I'm in my final semester of my master's in art education. So um, m honestly, I would say doing this. Um, it really is reaching out as much as you possibly can. I mean, what I have learned has been by, you know, working with each other. Um, you know, Alfie and I collaborate in the summer and what he brought into the studio was enormous and I learned from him by doing um, Logan you and I were sort of collaborating up that steep slope in the spring so connecting 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 with other art educators um, and really like just trying stuff you know the designer in me is sort of like yeah throw it up against the wall and see if it sticks um, if it doesn't Try it different way. So experimentation is where it's at. All right, thank you. I think we're out of time. Thank you so much to our incredible faculty. Again, check out their bios to learn more about them on our website and check out our website for more information on us and the Youth Arts Summit. And thank you for all for coming. I'm gonna hand it back over to Beth, who's gonna close us out. Um, yes, yeah, so we have, um, to two workshops that we're promoting um, for the rest of the week to um, uh, you, um, the Unspoken Stories um, tomorrow at noon, there's spots open for that. Um, and then on, let's see, on Thursday at four, the BAVAC workshop. And, um, and please, please, please come to the Youth Arts Summit uh, culminating celebration on Friday to see all um, to see all the presentations of the students work um, Friday from 4 to 530. So we hope to see you there. And thank you so much for joining us.